we say welcome and good morning. This is the Phoenix Seventh Day Baptist Church, and uh, we who live here are here pretty regularly. I see the same bunch of folks I'm used to seeing here, and that's always a nice thing. And so anybody else out there that uh, is ever in the Phoenix area, please come by on Sabbath day. On our website, you can see the address and the time and everything. So please come. We'd love to see you. So we're, we're here to worship and uh, hear God's word. And so let's uh, let's just pause a minute and ask God to lead us today. Lord God, it is good to be here together on on your Sabbath. We're thankful for the blessings. We're thankful especially for what you have done for us through Christ and all that follows, all that we can ever do or say or think. It needs to be a response to your grace and your love for us. Guide us today. Thank you for bringing us here safely. Ask your blessing on, on us as we worship and serve you today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. This morning we are reading from... Uh, the King James Bible, verse uh, from John 20, 31, and that reads, But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your plan of salvation so that by believing in you and your son, we can be saved. We thank you for giving us a country in which we are free to pray. We thank you for our church family and for all those who listen to us. We thank you for all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Very much, everybody remember a thing called Y two K. Now we got kids here who are way too young to remember that, but the rest of us can. We can remember when the twentieth century became the twenty first century of the Christian era. You know, even more amazing, maybe we've kind of forgotten that on that same day, the second millennium of the Christian era became the third millennium. Well, that won't happen again for a very long time. You know, during that time, just before, in the weeks and months before January 1st, 2000, everybody was worried about you know, what was going to happen on that day, whether the computers were all going to go bad, and all of the processes that are run by computers. Goodness, what would happen if if, uh, if all the computer clocks suddenly thought that it was the year 1900? As it turned out, it wasn't much of a problem at all. Good thing. Well, there's nothing that I can remember from back then. <clears throat> I mean, I don't remember exactly when this was, but within the first year or two after the change of, of the millennium, uh, they, whoever they are, you never know who they are, but um, I'm kind of guessing if I'm, and I don't remember if this is right, but maybe it was uh, Time Magazine. You remember when? Time Magazine would always have, well, for a long time, it was Man of the Year, and then it was Person of the Year. Anyway, they decided that they would go back into the previous millennium, and they would decide to choose one person 
from that millennium who lived, you know, sometime between AD 1000 and 2000, who they would call man of the millennium. Uh, I guess the question was, what person made the one greatest accomplishment of the second millennium? I thought they made a pretty good choice. Does anyone remember who it was? It was Johannes Gutenberg, the man who invented printing. Is it now, for the first time in history, multiple copies of one piece of writing could be printed exactly the same. And they didn't have to depend on you know, people copying by hand, whether they would get it right. And so printing really changed everything. And of course, all of this is a lead up to the idea of something being, first of all, written and then printed, of course. There was a lot of writing before Gutenberg. And what is still the best selling book of all time was written long before. And of course, that's the Bible. If I'm not mistaken, I believe the Bible was the first book that Gutenberg printed. Am I right? I think that's right. Well, the Apostle John was one of those Bible writers. Uh, earlier, we heard one of the very last verses in John's Gospel. Now, I realize our Wednesday night Bible study, we will be coming, coming to this verse sometime soon. I'm just getting kind of a head start. I hope that's okay. Uh, today, if this kind of verse were written in a book, it would be called a purpose statement or something similar. This is the author telling us, telling his readers why he wrote the book. You know, authors today, you, if they're going to give a purpose statement, they usually put it near the beginning of the book, like in a preface or uh, introduction. John put his at the very end. Now, there are three important parts to this pur purpose statement, so let's look at those. The first is these are written or these have been written now i think this is right nobody sits down and writes something just for the sake of writing uh, something that has been written is supposed to be read by someone um you know one one thing i remember from when we had foster children is that in a few cases, not very many, in a few, some of those kids eventually develop a love for reading. And of course, our own daughters did the same thing. Now, you know, some did this sooner, some later, but it was a great thing to see when, when they did it, because a love of reading is something that can serve you for the rest of your life. One of my favorite old sayings is, so many books, so little time. <laughs> well, of all the books that we have available, the Bible is, of course, the most important one ever written. There's a good reason why it's the all-time bestseller. Of course, selling it and reading it are two different things. Assuming that we all have a Bible, we need to make sure that we're reading it. Well, today let's, let's think about why we should read it, why these things were written. First of all, in John's Gospel, and of course, in, in the rest of the Bible. See, some things about life have changed, I guess you could say since the Bible was written, and they've even changed since Gutenberg. Uh, some of those changes are very nice, some of them are awful. 
seems like, you know, for one thing, one of the changes that we see, like in our culture and some others, is that the line between between truth and and error has become kind of blurred. And besides that, you know, more and more people question whether there really is any truth and error. You know, maybe at one time, but not anymore. So today we have something called relativism. Ever heard of that? You know, when I was young, I never heard of relativism. I mean, I can remember relativity, you know, Einstein, and, but not relativism. The idea that truth itself is not at all absolute, but it varies from one person to another. There, there's an old catchphrase, you know, yeah, that might be true for you, but not for me. The problem with relativism is it just doesn't work. <laughs> it's not true. Uh, the classic case, of course, is that if if you say that murder is wrong, well, I could say, hey, that might be true for you, but it's not for not true for me. And because I don't like you, I think I'll murder you. Uh, according to what my belief thinks is true. Now, that might seem like an obvious example, but, you know, many cases are not that obvious. And so lots of people are just plain confused. And, of course, half-truths get in there with the full truths, and that becomes confusing. What's right and what's wrong? Or is there any right and wrong? Another variation of this is, is when people base their beliefs on what I guess you call a subjective experience rather than objective truth. You know, somebody hears a voice and believes that God is teaching them some new revelation, but they don't check it out with what God has already revealed in the Bible. It's so easy to uh, prefer subjective over objective. Well, these are all reasons why we have the Bible and why these things have been written, as John put it. And you notice that John wrote it, not just said it. I'm sure you know that, that a lot of what's in the Bible was actually spoken first and then was written later. Uh, we can't get along without a Bible. We have to see it as our source of truth. Well, this verse then goes on to say what should happen because these, these things were written and that is so that you may believe. Once in a while, I don't know about you, but, but uh, once in a while I've seen, you know, usually on television, <laughs> uh, the word believe all by itself, on, you know, on a sign of some sort, kind of like a slogan. I've seen that at, in the background of the, at the, political conventions. I've seen that at sports games. People hold up signs with, you know, all, you know, printed very nicely and everything. And, and it's just that one word, believe. Well, the problem is nobody ever stops to ask, believe what? Seems to me that part is pretty important. You don't just believe, you have to believe something. Well, at baseball games, it, it would be believe that we can win the championship. 
political conventions, it's belief that, that we can win the election. The belief has to have an object, and the object of your belief has to be something that's true. I mean, would you jump off a building holding a sign that says, believe, because you believe you can fly? Some kinds of belief are useless and even harmful. So, of course, John told his readers what to believe. That Jesus is Christ. Now, for those who don't know, uh, the word Christ in Greek is the same as Messiah in Hebrew. The word means anointed one, and it's one of the names of the Savior who is to come. Uh, actually, all, almost more like a title than a name. Well, the whole point of the book that John wrote is that the Christ who was to come came. So the important thing here is, do we believe it? And just to make sure, <laughs> this doesn't mean just believing that a man named Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. I mean, anyone could do that. Believe here comes from a Greek word, it can also be translated faith or trust. These things were written so that we will put our faith in Christ and trust him to save us from sin and death. Before Jesus came, there were other people who claimed to be Messiah or King or Goodness, even, even God. And there have been many more since then. And of course, Jesus himself made that claim. Well, these have been written to show us the, the things he said and the things he did and to show us that in his case, the claim is true. Um, if you like the word credentials, <laughs> Jesus was the only one who had the credentials to back up the claim. But you know, even then, it's still possible for people to reject him. They might read John's Gospel, they might read the rest of the New Testament, even the whole Bible, and still decide that they don't believe Jesus is the Christ. And we say, well, you know, how can that be? <laughs> well, look at what happened back when he was on the earth. When he was here, there were hundreds, even, perhaps even thousands of people who actually saw him and heard him in person. Not very many of them believed in him. But, to those who do believe, the rest of this verse tells the result of believing in Jesus, that you may have life in his name. And isn't this really the goal of the whole thing? I mean, everybody would prefer life over death. <laughs> and the Bible shows us not just life, but eternal life. This is the point of the writing. This is the point of reading what's been written. And this is the point of believing what we've read. When we do that, God gives us life. In the Bible, death is always a negative thing unless it's the death of a Christian. Then it's the next part of eternal life, and it's the door into heaven. I'm guessing that, you know, everybody here has at least one Bible, am I right? Um, 
Anyone here not have a Bible? That would be very surprising. God's plan has all been written for all of us to read and believe and have eternal life. So are we reading it? You know, maybe one problem is is that we have so much writing. Uh, so much to choose from. Seems like anybody can publish a book. But if we've ever spent any time browsing the internet or maybe in the old days reading a newspaper, uh, we know that just because something is written down doesn't make it true. But on the other hand, if something is true, it probably has been written somewhere, and God's truth is in the Bible. In God's kingdom, he doesn't allow the uh, anything goes, which is so common today. We're supposed to agree with him, and we won't do that unless we know what's been written here, and we get that by reading it and by hearing it. Whenever those times may happen, when he might, when it would seem as though he's speaking to us outside the Bible, whether something else we might have read or what somebody might have said, whatever that might be, we need to confirm it with what's in the Bible. And always keep in mind the main purpose to believe what's been written, and to have life in his name. We pray. Father, we do thank you for giving us something worth believing in. I should say, someone <laughs> worth believing in. And we thank you for revealing this to us in your written word. We just praise you for the gift of faith so that we're able to trust Jesus to save us. We pray for more and more people to find life in him. Amen. Well, since Thanksgiving's coming up this week, how about we close with a, one of the old Thanksgiving hymns?